God's peace and blessing be upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our fast. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our prayers. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our recitation of the Quran. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our charity in this beautiful month of Ramadan. We are in the second, ten, uh, second uh, uh, night of the last 10 nights of Ramadan. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those people who are forgiven in this month of Ramadan. And not, just, and not just that, to be those people who are freed from health in this month of Ramadan and to give us the ability to continue after the month of Ramadan. And subhanAllah, Ramadan is flying fast, running fast, you know, getting out of our hands, subhanAllah. What have we done to take advantage of this beautiful month of Ramadan? Today, we have a very beautiful, amazing leader we're going to talk about. Yes, he's a hero, but he is in the capacity and he's in the capability of a leader. To explain to you his time and his situation, you need to know more about his family, more about how did he come to be the person he was. Uh, we're talking today about Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he is from the Umayyad. And the Umayyad is a clan of Quraysh. After Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr was the Khalifa. And the Khalifa, what means by Khalifa? We mean the Muslim leader of the all Muslims. Second after that, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he was the Khalifa. Then after Umar radiallahu anhu was Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. And after Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And after that was Muawiyah and later on became in the family of Muawiyah and Bani Umayyah, the, the Khilafah, to be the Muslim leader. So uh, we're talking about Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he's from that royal family, or the first ever royal family in the Islamic history to rule. He, is, well, he was born in Medina, and his father, Abdul Aziz, Ibn Marwan, he was the governor of Egypt. So I wanted to explain to you a little bit about the Muslims at that time. It will be one Khalifa in one place, basically the president, and there will be different states. And those states are run by the governors chosen by the Khalifa himself, you know, very similar to the system that we have here right now. Okay? So it will be a president or a Khalifa, and then will be governors who run the places. So Omar was born in a family of royal. His father, Abdul Aziz, was the governor of Egypt. But he was born actually in Medina. And he was born specifically in the, six, in the year 61. He is that from his side. He was from Bani Umayyah, from the royal family. How about his mom's side? His mom, let me tell you, if I tell you her name, you will know who is his mom. His mom is Layla, daughter of Asim, son of Umar al-Khattab. So his, mo his mother is the granddaughter of Umar al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu. Everybody knows who, who's Umar al-Khattab. But his, 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 his grandfather, his uh, Umar grandfather, Asim ibn Umar al-Khattab, has a very interesting story how he met his wife. Who is his wife? His wife is uh, the one that he married. To give him this, the daughter Layla, Layla later on to marry uh, Abdul Aziz uh, to, be, to have the son Umar later on. So what happened? Let me explain to you. That's a very interesting story. And some of you might not know the story. Once in Medina at the time of Umar al-Khattab, when Umar al-Khattab was the Khalifa, uh, a lady, Umar al-Khattab used, used to have this thing that he used to actually leave uh, his house at night to check on the city of Medina, see how people are doing and what's going on and how is everything going on around them. And subhanAllah, one day he was walking around the night in Medina and he heard this conversation in some house. A mother asking her daughter to do what? To add water to the milk. Uh, so they basically, it's a family who their business is to sell milk. So a mother asking her daughter, in order for us to make a lot of milk, add water to it. And when you add a lot of water to it, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be a lot of milk so we can sell it. The mother told her, but Omar said, don't do that. Omar said, you're not supposed to do that. Why you do something like that? And the mother said, Omar is not here to see us. But then the daughter said something so beautiful. She said, but the Lord of Umar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees everybody and see what, we, what we're doing. So next day, Umar al-Khattab, he asked about this house, who this house, you know, and asked about this, this girl. Who is this girl? And she was like in her 20s. And then he went to his children. He told one of his children, uh, he told all, actually all his children, he told them, guys, who would marry somebody so, right, so, so righteous? Who would marry somebody who's so honest? So his son, Asim, said, I will marry her. And he married her, and then they had the child that actually was uh, the mother of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, radiallahu anhu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be, be pleased with all of them, inshallah. So as we said, he was born in year 61 of Hijra in Medina. His father was the governor of Egypt. So he grew up a very small life. He had everything. 
So his father wanted to learn Islam and to study Islam. So later on, when he was born in Medina, but he lived all his life in Egypt. So his father decided to send him to Medina to learn, to be educated there, to learn among the scholars. Actually, he, he learns among, uh, with the, all the scholars there that eight of his teachers were Sahaba. Can you imagine? Eight of his uh, teachers were Sahaba, and 25 of his, te of his teachers were actually students of Sahaba. So he went to Medina, and he learned actually there with his teachers, and he specifically had a teacher, a very rightful teacher, was, his name was Saleh. And he was a mentor, and he was a teacher. And Umar at that time in Medina, he was a young man. He was a boy, actually. So one day, uh, his teacher was telling him, you have to come to the masjid early. You have to be on time in the masjid. You cannot be late. And imagine, that's the masjid in Nabawi. So one day, uh, his teacher and everybody in the masjid, they're praying. The salah came in, and everybody prayed. So Umar showed up late to the masjid after the salah ended. So his teacher, Saleh, looked at him and was like, why are you late? Where were you? Why did you come late to the salah? We already finished salah. He said, sorry, I was taking care of my hair. He had a beautiful hair. He was taking care of it. And he said, you're taking what? You're taking care of your hair? So you love your hair more than you love the salah? So Saleh, the, his teacher and mentor, sent a letter to his father. He said, look, he did your son. Look what his son did. So he went and shaved his head. He's completely shaved his head. Not to buzz his head. They had, didn't have machines at that time, but actually used the razor to shave his head. He told him, if you love your hair that much more than salah, that's a problem. You have to love salah more than loving anything in your life because we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we should love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than anything else. So that's the environment that Umar grew up in. Environment of fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Environment of being mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Environment of loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he memorized the Quran at a very young age. When he was a boy, he memorized the Quran. And later on, even the scholars of Medina, uh, uh, many scholars like uh, uh, Imam, famous Imam named Mujahid and other scholars, they used to say, we actually want to teach Umar. We want to become the teachers, the teachers of Umar, but we end up to be his students. We end up to be learning from him, mashallah. He was very smart, very intelligent. And subhanAllah, he grew up this, you know, righteous, righteous life. And also at the same time, he had everything he wanted. Imagine his father is the governor of Egypt. He would have anything. He, he, he had all the wealth that he could think of. At the age of 25, the Khalifa of the Muslims at that time called Umar. And the, and the, cent, the central place or the capital of the Muslim at that time used to be a Sham, Damascus specifically. So he called Umar, he said to Umar, I want you to be the governor of Medina. You, you actually learn in Medina, you grow up in Medina, you know the people of Medina very well. And his uncles at that time from his mom's side, they called them Ben al-Khattab, the grandchildren of Umar al-Khattab, they all were in Medina. He said, I want you to be the governor in Medina. Umar said, for me to take responsibility, you have to accept things from me. And at that time, many injustice was going around. People actually, the royal family, they used, they used to actually claim lands and take lands that did belong to the state, they didn't belong you know, to them. He said, if I want to become the, the governor of Medina, if you want me to be the governor of Medina, I have to give the people what belongs to them. I have to be just. And I cannot just send you whatever you ask of money. When we take from people, we take the right thing from them. We take the zakah. We don't put taxation on people. We don't take land from people. We don't, we see a beautiful land that doesn't belong to anybody and it should belong to the state. We start giving it and gifting it to others. And this is going on until today. We have some royal family, some other places they do things like this. So the Khalifa, he agreed. He said, okay, you do whatever you want to do. Go ahead. And he became at a young age, very young age, the governor of Medina. And not just that, then he became the governor of Hijaz. And the governor of Hijaz, that include Mecca, that include Ta'if, this area that we call the Hijaz. And he became the governor of Hijaz. And later on, after the Khalifa passed away, another Khalifa came, and that was his cousin. His cousin called him and he said, I want you to come and be what? And be my advisor. So he went his, to Damascus and he became the advisor of the Khalifa at that time. And he was very watchful advisor, telling the truth to the, to the governor, to the, to the Khalifa and Muslim leader tell him what you need to do. Not telling him, you know what, uh, don't worry about it. No one knows what you're doing. Do whatever you want. You're so powerful. SubhanAllah. Until that Khalifa was going to die, he chose Umar Abdul Abd Aziz to be the Khalifa. But he, when he chose Umar Abdul Abd Aziz, he didn't tell him you're going to be the Khalifa after me. He didn't know. He wrote in his will that Umar Abdul Abd Aziz would be the Khalifa after me. And he died. So they opened the well of uh, the Khalifa and said, Umar is the Khalifa. So they went looking for, in, in Damascus, they went looking for Umar. Where is Umar? And then they found him in the masjid. And they want to bring him the news. And that time, that's a wonderful news. That's amazing news. Imagine. 
you become what? The Khalifa. And imagine the Muslim state at that time from Spain all the way to the border of China. A huge, huge piece of land, a huge, like you're talking about big, big, how many countries and, and now in this land, subhanAllah. So he went and he, they told him, I said, Umar, and he was sitting there, Umar, uh, the Khalifa died and he chose you to be after him and we have the will and you're going to be the Khalifa after. He fell. He could not stand. He fell. And he kept saying, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We belong to Allah uh, we, and we shall return to him. You know, we say this when somebody dies. He's saying this because he felt the responsibility. He was a person who really understood the responsibility. Then he gathered the people in the masjid and he told the people, you know what? I was chosen, I did not choose it. I did not, I was chosen, I did not choose it. I did not want to be the Khalifa, but I was chosen. And I'm not the best among you, but I'm going to change what's going on right now. So he called his cousins, Bani Umayyah, Bani Marwan, though, and they used to be very filthy rich. You know, benefiting from the lands that the Khalifas used to give them and they used the government used to give them. And he took everything that shouldn't belong to them. He took everything from them that shouldn't belong to them. And he said, I start with my family before anyone else. Then went to his wife and he told his wife, I want to give everything that was gifted to us away. And he gifted everything. Even they, they was, he was gifted palaces. He was given, he said, gifted houses. He said, no, I just want this, my house, this, that, my original house I'm staying. I don't want anything else. And then he went to his house, he went into the room and he started crying. So his wife looked at him and was like, why are you crying? You're the Khalifa right now. You're the Muslim leader. He said, I'm thinking if there is somebody who's sick and they cannot help. And if there's somebody who's hungry and cannot feed. SubhanAllah. That's feeling the responsibility. That's a true meaning of leadership. Being able to feel for others and your own people and being able to serve everybody around you. And then they went to him and he said, you're the... You're the Amir of Mu'mineen. You're the leaders of the Mu'mineen, of the believers. Why you're riding your small, he had his small donkey at that time. He said, why try riding something like that? We have this entourage of horses and people who go around. He's like, I don't need any of that. I don't need that. This is sufficient to me and this is enough for me. And then he gathered all the employees at that time of the state in, in, in the Sham area. And he told him, remember, when you want to do something in justice, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable to do more to you. And then he sent letters to all the governors and asked them to be their best and to, to show justice and mercy and fairness toward everybody. And subhanAllah, not just that, he, he, he managed the state so well and he gathered zakah and he gave zakah to the poor that the Muslims reached a point. I want you to think of very carefully. The Muslims at that time reached a, po a point there was not a poor person at all. The person will go gathering their zakat. The people will go holding their zakat, going to, to the khalifa, going to the governor, going to, the, to find poor people to give them. It's like, here's my money. Find the poor people, give them. They would say, we don't, we don't, we, we don't know anybody who's poor here. We couldn't find anybody who's poor. Everybody's, mashallah, with, with money and wealth. Imagine, subhanAllah. That actually what they used to do at the, with the money of zakat, because they will have so much money left over, they will, find, they will buy seeds and they throw it in the mountains for the birds. They will find, uh, will buy meat, and they'll throw it in the mountain for the animals, you know, for the wild cats, uh, mountain lions, all that. They'll throw meats for them in the mountains so they, they feed, feed them. Because they didn't, they didn't know what to do with the money. SubhanAllah. How long he ruled to be able to accomplish that? Only two years. Rabbi Abdul Aziz ruled only for two, two years only. With all the wealth the state had at that time, and how he managed everything in a very, in very beautiful way, one day, he went to his wife and he said, his wife was named, or her name was Fatima. He said, Fatima, I'm craving some grapes. I would like some grapes, but I don't have money. Imagine. He is a Muslim leader at that time. He's like, I have no money on me. Do you have any money? He said, I don't. He's like, but how come you say you don't have money? You can go to the treasury and ask them for whatever you want, I'll give you. And you go buy whatever you want. And this is how you know you solve your craving. And you know, since you crave grapes, and you can buy them and, and eat them. He said, no, I'll be patient. Because in the day of judgment, I don't know if I'll be patient when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throw me in hell for taking from the Muslims what, what doesn't belong to me, subhanAllah. He had this understanding that these, the money, this wealth belongs to the Muslim, did not belong to me. And subhanAllah, how many leaders we see like this nowadays? SubhanAllah, how many, uh, this quality of leaders are very rare because many leader, leaders, they justify themselves, you know? Especially those of royal families, they think they own everything. They own the land, they own the people. 
it belongs to them. Subhanallah. He, he changed the way people think of leadership. He changed the people think, thought of a, of a Khalifa himself, subhanAllah. Very beautiful. The way he, he acted and the way how he was very mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To what it used to be said about him, that whenever he read the Quran, he used to cry. And he was very attached to the Quran and he was very sensitive when he read the ayat of the punishment in the Quran and he used to cry. So when he was close to die, and actually he ruled only two years and then he gets sick. And some of the historians, they, they, they told us that he was actually poisoned. And some of the historians actually, they show the proof that later on people find the person who poisoned him. Actually one of the cooks in his palace or his house at that time poisoned him because he was paid of those people who were hurt by his justice and fairness, subhanAllah. And he gets sick, he gets so sick. So he gathered his children and he had 11 children. And he told them, listen, I don't have much. Whatever he left for them is 18 dinar. 18 dinar is like equivalent maybe to $18 or a little bit more. He said, that's what I have. I have nothing much. I'm not leaving you wealth to take care of you, he said, but I'm leaving you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, I'm leaving you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to take care of you. And subhanAllah, he died with this $18 he had only. They spent five to buy his grave and three or two to buy his coffin the coffin to cover him in, to bury him. SubhanAllah, that's what you think about the Muslim leaders. And the Muslim state from oil, Spain all the way to the border of China, SubhanAllah. He, he decided to let go all this belonging of this dunya. Later on, actually, later on, some of the historians, they tell us that his children, they were so rich and they were among the most generous people in the, uh, during that time, SubhanAllah. Because he let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take, take care of them. Sometimes we worry so much about our children. We worry about, about many things that are around us. But we need to let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of that. We need to do our best. But then let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of that. Don't, don't, don't think that you can change things by yourself without the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't think that, you know what, uh, you should be in charge of completely your affairs. The person or the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who should be in charge of your affairs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he should be the only one who takes care of everything around you. And actually, he was buried in the city of Idlib, south of, south of the city of Idlib, city of Idlib in Syria right now. And subhanAllah, so sad. This year, actually, 2020 in January, uh, Al-Assad regime in Syria, they try actually to ruin his grave and they broke it out. They tried to burn it, subhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, protect him in his grave. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring us leaders like him who care about justice and fairness and leaders who people can trust because they're trying their best for the ummah not trying for this, uh, their best for themselves and that's very important when you are given responsibility don't think i'm a young man you know what who cares no you'll be given responsibility or you know i'm a young woman i'm a young man who cares about what i do right now you'll be given responsibility and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold you of this responsibility and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will see what you have done Read about Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. There's many beautiful stories about him and many things about him you can learn. Learn about him and be someone of responsibility, of responsibility like him. Jazakumullah khair. And inshallah, we'll end with dua. Inshallah. And inshallah, next week will be our last week, inshallah, in this series of the Heroes of Allah, our son, history, inshallah. Allahumma khil lana dunubana wa israfana fi amrina wa kafir anna sayyatina wa tawafana ma'al abrar Allahumma taqabbal minna siyamana wa qiyamana wa ruku'ana wa sujudana wa saliha a'malina ya rabbal alameen Allahumma ya hayu ya qayyum birahmatika nastaghith اصلح لنا شاننا كله ولا تكلنا إلى أنفسنا طرفة عين اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من المرض والجنون والجدام وسيء الأسقام اللهم اعتق رقابنا من النار اللهم اعتق رقابنا من النار اللهم اعتق رقابنا ورقاب والدينا وأزواجنا وذرياتنا من النار يا رب العالمين اللهم تب علينا إنك أتنت التواب الرحيم اللهم بلغنا ليلة القدر اللهم بلغنا ليلة القدر اللهم بلغنا ليلة القدر اللهم اجعلنا ممن يصوم رمضان إيمانا واحتسابا 
اللهم اجعلنا ممن يقوم رمضان إيمانا واحتسابا اللهم تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا الله إنك أنت التواب الرحيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين جزاكم الله خير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سيدك سيدك السلام عليكم